the mountains get so high sometimes I know the valley seems so wide It seems this journey it will never end And you keep asking the question come why So rocky at times I, I know the heartaches are severe It seems like life will never change It's tied But there's an answer To all of life cares Stay with God In spite of what you see Stay with God. This is a four hour session. You can try to condense it within 30 minutes to an hour. And we continue on with our ensemble, Galatians chapter 6. Everybody to read one verse, Galatians chapter 6. Voice 6. Sorry, I should have told you that before. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. Galatians, the third book from St. John's. John's, the Acts, Romans, Corinthians, and Galatians. St. John's, the Acts of the Apostles. Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians. Galatians chapter 6, verse Together we read, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teach it in all good things. What that basically is saying is though I am teaching, you are the student. Make yourself available to ask questions or speak, ask as a teacher. So this is the point where we have an open house. If you have a question, please don't wait till the end. Ask the question right away. Raise your hand and be identified. Or if you have an input, raise your hand and be identified to recognize and we'll make our input. Because if we wait until we finished everything to ask questions, we may forget where we are. Now, whereas we are talking about the Holy Ghost, what is the Holy Ghost? There are some things that may already be in your mind, some thoughts. So we'll go back. As we have read earlier, in chapter 14, verse 16 through 18, we're reading again. Jesus in verse 16 through 18 spoke of another comforter. He will give unto his apostles, his disciples, that you and me, us, all of us. After his ascension into heaven. Now let's read that and understand what we are, what Jesus is saying. Verse 16. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. If your Bible is different, hopefully we get to the same point. Is that Galatians? St. John chapter 14. Where did right one we, we just read? So John chapter 14 began reading the three verses we covered, which we just covered. Verse 16 again. Jesus said to his apostles, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. What is Jesus saying? He says, You shall have another comforter. But Jesus is obviously telling you that he, while he is with you, is your comforter. He is providing comfort for you because he is getting ready to depart the world 
I need to pray the Father to give us another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And this comforter will do what? Abide with you forever. Not now or later, forever. And if the comforter will abide with you, which means you will never be comfortless. Let's go to the seventh verse, 17th verse. As Jesus is with his disciples, giving them comfort, Jesus confirms he will not leave them comfortless. So verse 17 says, and even the spirit of truth. You all see that word even? Do you, I, everybody have the, um, <coughs> the original King James version? You may have that word even written right in front of you. Now, I don't know which version you have. Your version may have a different word. Jesus said, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. He said something, Pastor. Where is that? Verse 17. Yes, reading verse 17. Remember, we were recapping 16, 17, 18, which we just read. We are recapping those three verses. And verse 17 says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be where? In you. Now we can understand that the comfort will be in us. Which basically says to us, if you listen to some of our international preachers and pastors and stuff, you hear them talking about let us invoke the Holy Spirit of the Lord to come and be with us. Now why would you want to invoke the Spirit of the Lord to come and be with you when Jesus said the Spirit will be in you, will abide with you? It's all a lack of understanding the Scriptures. Because if Jesus said, once he leaves, which he did left, and as you know, 10 days later, the Holy Comforter returned. And everybody received the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. And if Jesus is going to be in you, you don't need to invoke it. It's in you. Paul made it clear. Paul said, stir up the gift within you. The free gift of God that's within you. That's the Holy Spirit of God. It's in you. We just got to stir it up. In the 18th verse here, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. <coughs> Jesus is confirming that though he is departing and going to the Father, he's not going to leave us comfortless. Whatsoever we do, whatsoever may happen, we will not be left comfortless. Now do we understand 16 and 17 when Jesus said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17 says, even the spirit of truth. That word, even, is an old English word. It means, that is. So when you were to read the word, even in the Bible, it's telling you, that is, or that is to say. So Jesus is saying, I will give you another comforter, and he will abide with you forever. That is to say, the spirit of truth. So Jesus is letting you know the spirit of truth and the comforter are one and the same. Are you okay with that? As it gets more complicated, but yet simple. If we stay with God, God will never leave us alone. As was just stated a few days ago in our prayer meeting, the subject was wait on God in our prayer meeting Monday night. But if you wait on God, you are still staying with God. Because to wait on God, you've got to stay put in waiting on God. But it doesn't mean sit down while we wait. We stay 
with God. And if they are, and if we stay with God, we'll never be alone nor lonely. So if there's a difference between, some people may say there's a difference between alone, there's a difference between lonely. But with the Holy Spirit of God, it's not in here, nor is it there. But the Holy Spirit of God is what? Omnipresence. Therefore, you will never be alone, nor lonely, if you stay with God. Let's read further to John in the same chapter, the 27th verse, and let's understand what is going on there. The 27th verse, right on the same chapter. Anyone may read that, please. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. What greater confirmation do you need? That Jesus is letting you know, even though he's departing, he's letting you know that his peace will be with you. If we stay with God, the peace of Jesus what? Abides with us always. You know you're familiar with that song, He Abides? It's a great, wonderful song, He Abides With Us. And stepping up one voice just further above that, it's the 26th verse. What is John saying in voice above that? But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have, have to, whatsoever I have said unto you. So there we know, according to Jesus, he is also confirming that the Holy Ghost, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, and the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of Truth, all four names are one and the same. So if you hear these different names, different places, at different times, to different people, we are speaking about the same thing, the same product, the same spirit. So let us know that the Holy Ghost, according to Jesus, is one and the same. Let's go to chapter 15. We're in the next chapter, right next door, and verse 26. John 15 and 26. What is Jesus saying there? Remember he's talking to his disciples on the night he was betrayed. Anyone read it please? Chapter 15 verse 26. When men the comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. I all see that word even drop in there again? You all see that word even drop in there again in this voice? What is the word telling you? What is that voice telling us? Jesus says in verse 26, But when the comforters come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, what is that word even is telling us there again? It's the same. They're the same. That is to say, the oh. spirit of truth. So Jesus is letting you know, don't be confused with these things, that the spirit of truth is the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. They all one and the same. Once we hold on to that, the Holy Ghost, whom God the Father was sent unto us on behalf of his only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ, will teach us what? All things as we read. Things that we have forgotten, we don't remember, the Holy Ghost brings it back to memory. So when you remember something and you say, oh, I just remember it, you know it's the action 
of the Holy Spirit within you that brings these things back to memory. Things that you have forgotten, things you did when you were six and you have forgotten all of a sudden, you just remember something when you was a child. This is the action or the work of the Holy Ghost within you. Brings things into remembrance. Whatsoever our Lord has previously taught us. So we know that the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, the Comforter, are and is one of the same. Stay with God for all these. This honor will abide with us all if we stay with God. Let's take it into another realm. Open your books, please, to Acts chapter 2. If you are St. John, Acts should not be far. Acts chapter 2. Acts is the next book following John. So it's only be about three pages away. If we can be in Acts chapter 2, and let us read from verse 1 to 4. Verse 1 to 4. We're only letting everybody read together <coughs> because of time. This could be a long session. We go one, one, we take longer. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly they came a sound from heaven as of a mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them two of like as of fire, and they sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Well, praise the Lord, a voice for us, letting us know when that mighty rushing wind came in. They were all filled with what? Holy Ghost. Or the Spirit of Truth. Or the Comforter. Or the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of God. All one and the same. Now Peter, on the day of Pentecost, what is Pentecost? You now most people read this, we don't know what Pentecost is. Pentecost has got absolutely nothing to do with the Jewish, but it's written in the book. It's written by a Greek, because the person who wrote the book of Acts is Luke. Luke never met Jesus, never knew him, never saw him, but yet he's got a whole book to his name. Now some people think that Luke met Jesus and talked with him, because somewhere in the book of John it says, now two Greeks came to see Jesus. And some people think this, one of these Greeks was Luke. But there's nothing to confirm nor deny this matter. So we're moving on. We'll discuss the Pentecost another time in another episode called The Spirit of Truth, which is being penned but not completed. But if you want to know now, just ask. Be open for questions at any time. Let everybody know what kind of cause I can't remember what I I read what it was, but I just I just can't remember what the meaning of Pentecost. What is it again? Pentecost, as you can see, <coughs> the day of Pentecost here in this chapter. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, let's read that first verse again so you get an understanding of Pentecost. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Now what is being said here? When the day of Pentecost was fully come, <coughs> the word here fully come does not mean it arrived. Fully come means it's over, it's ended. This is the last day, it's finished. Most people read this think it's, it's come, it's just reached. No. It's ended. This is the last day. Pentecost is a Greek festival period of time which lasts seven weeks. And it goes for 50 days. 
Now, if it goes seven weeks, that gives you 49 days. All right? Seven days, one week, seven weeks, that'd be 49 days. But yet, Pentecost is 50 days because of the way Penta in Greek means 50. And how we guess the 50 days of Pentecost in Greek starts on a Sunday and ends on a Sunday. Because it ends on a Sunday, that's how you get 50 days. Pentecost is a Greek seven week feast festival of their gods, not our God. Their gods. They celebrate seven weeks of festival, the Greeks. Luke is a Greek. Luke is writing things pretending on his area. He grew up in the Grecian territory. So most of what you read in, in Luke is written under Grecian ideas and not Hebrew. We got two Hebrew ideas in the Bible, that's Matthew and John, because these were two apostles of Jesus. Mark and Luke is Greek. They are not Hebrew. Mark grew up in the Grecian area, but his parents were Jewish. Mother and father Jews, but they grew up in the Grecian area. So he, he was Grecian fear. Mark also never saw Jesus. Fact is, when Mark joined up with Paul, Jesus was long gone, 20 years later, after Jesus' ascension. Luke came in about the same time. Luke was an elderly fellow. Mark was a young guy. Mark is Barnabas. We all familiar with Barnabas. That's Barnabas' nephew, Barnabas' sister, son. And they connected. And Mark, man, this guy a whole book reading in the Bible. Matthew, Mark. His name is John Mark. And he was a protege of Paul, who, you know, was Saul. So Luke and Mark are proteges or disciples of, Luke, of Saul. Paul, sorry. Because he had changed his name from Saul to Paul. That's Pentecost. It's a Greek holiday of seven weeks. And the last day of that holiday has come. It's arrived. And it's on this last day when the Holy Spirit of God came into the upper room. And the apostles and disciples and those who were there will receive the Holy Ghost on that particular day. Yes, question. Yes, um, you're talking about Pentecost. The festival. So why were the disciples in the upper room at that point? If they don't celebrate the Pentecost? I just explained it to you. The author of the book, Luke, is Grecian. He's from the city of Troas in the Grecian territory. He's a disciple of Paul. Luke wrote this book. He wrote it according to his legend, his life living. Pentecost coincidentally, coincidentally just happened to fall in that period of time. So Luke is writing on the now Pentecost has come, now the last day of Pentecost is here. And it is this day that these guys are receiving the Holy Ghost. Luke is Greek, he's writing his thing. We are behemoth, we writing something, we try to write things behemoth. We should. A Greek that got in there, a Greek, and a lot of people think that Pentecost is, you know, Jewish. But from Genesis to Revelation, the way Pentecost is nowhere. The Greeks never celebrate Pentecost. Not the Jews. It's not in their life. From, would you say, from book, from Genesis 1 to Revelation 10, there's no such Pentecost. It's only in. Um, Luke speaking it, yes. So in other words, the writer now is portraying a time frame <clears throat> when they were actually in the upper room. Yes, that's a time frame. That's what it is. But unfortunately, the time frame is relative to Greek celebration <coughs> and not Jewish celebration. Because remember, Luke is not a Jewish pen to paper. It's Greek, Grecian. Luke joined up with Paul, 
when Paul visited Troas, the city that he lived in, in Greece. And he joined them. I think I walked that through y'all the other day. I think I did walk that through y'all, and I showed you that Luke is talking about a story that was told to him. And they went here, and they went there. Then the story shift from we are now going here, and we are now going there. Hmm? That was Luke telling the story of Acts of the Apostles. He said, in day that mean Paul would have told him where they went. And when he started to be went, that means he's talking with his accompaniment with the body, with the crew. That is what? It's Luke, a Greek. I just want to add one thing. Is, um, uh, Pentecost was the festival, was the festivities that they were holding uh, at the same time when Jesus made his ascension. He told them to go to the upper room. And um, he told them to wait there until uh, they be endured with power. Now the festival that they were having, it was a Jewish festival that they were having, and there were a number of people from a number of nations that attended that. If you read from verses 19 to 11, 17 nations. read from verses 9 to 11, and you'll see all of those people who came to attend the festivity. They didn't come there, so he, because they didn't know what was going to happen from the upper room. No, they didn't. Okay, they didn't know anything with that. But the, when the day of their festivity was fully come, is that the same thing time that the Holy Spirit descended upon those who were in the upper room. The same time it happened. And these people were so surprised. Look from verse, from verse 9, from verse 9 through uh, verse 11, and you'll see who all were there. Okay. The 17 different nations. Yeah. All of them were there to attend. They were there to attend the festivity. Jesus just made it possible. And, and, and you, you better know that how deep uh, this is. Jesus just made it possible that the gospel now is going to be spread because these people come to find enjoyment. But then to attend the festivity and enjoyment. But within that festivity, now the, the Holy Spirit, Jesus going down, the Holy Spirit now is taking over. And they're hearing now these people who are supposed to be illiterate people, now speaking fluently in their language. And this was the thing that got their attention. That's why when Peter preached the message, 3,000 souls came to know Christ. Simply because, and they were not all Jews, there were some of these same people who came to attend the party, the festivities that were going on. Like you have the tourists that come from during Christmas, they come to attend Jonkano. Well, Jesus just allowed things to happen during that festivity, break up the festivity, and there was the speaking in tongues. Speaking in tongues mean that they were speaking in the language of every nation that was there. And, and, uh, and so this was. Jesus has make it make something, turn something around for him, for his glory, not for the glory of man. Because the glory of man was just to have drink and get drunk and have a good time. That's why Peter had to tell them, we're not drunk as you suppose, because that was a festivity. That was the time of high festivity. And they were thinking, well, these guys are drunk, they have good wine. And Peter had to tell them, we're not drunk as you suppose, but we are filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. yeah, Jesus just allowed to make a big turn around, and, and perhaps you may see that in our jungle group parade one this time. Yeah, Jesus just make a big turn around because he said in the last days they're going to be outpouring, and Peter referenced that this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel that in the last days I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. So it, it is. It is that I just wish to add on to there. Well, that's, that's good. That's okay. One that you know, all all of what he just said is in the same chapter, chapter two. Yeah. All of what he just said. So when you got time, you can go to read chapter two and get more acquainted with it. Now, while we're in chapter two, let's go to verse thirty-seven. Stay in the chapter two, verse thirty-seven. We can add to what Pastor just stated. And now, as Mr. Rose stated. This is a time frame that the Holy Ghost was given. 
This is 10 days later after the ascension. Verse 37 to verse 40. Can we read that please together? Verse 37 to verse 40. Now, when they, How were they, <coughs> they were pricked <coughs> in the heart and said to Peter, and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? <laughs> then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive. You shall receive what? So it's the Holy Ghost something that you buy. It's a free gift of God. That's why Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, stir up the gift within you. Let's finish reading with 38. It's 39, sorry. For the promise to your children, to all that are far off. Even again, even as many as the Lord have brought to cause. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. This is Peter further expounding more on as Pastor just said. At least he didn't know this piece was coming up. I have fast forward. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, as we said, to recap that particular verse again. Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Who was pricked in their hearts? All the people that were there that heard this. The Holy Ghost and the guys speaking these different languages that they didn't think it was possible. And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, because they want to be a part of this ushering. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of? Jesus. Be baptized in the name of? Jesus. It's written there. Verse 38. Verse 38. Be baptized in the name of? Jesus Christ. For the remission of sins, and you shall receive what? The gifts of the Holy Ghost. The reason I bring this part up. It's coming later on in this lesson, if we have time. Paul goes on his mission. And he meets some men in Corinthians and asks them, Have you received the Holy Ghost? And this guy is like, Holy Ghost, what is that? They're totally lost and confused. But we have been baptized. So now Paul let them know, okay, you were baptized, but you don't know what the Holy Ghost is. See, they were baptized in John the Baptist baptism, not in Jesus' baptism. So being baptized in John baptism, I'm jumping the gun, but we're coming to that. They received, they did it for the baptism of repentance. But with the name Jesus Christ, you're being baptized to receive the Holy Ghost. And when you receive the Holy Ghost, Jesus said, this is power given unto you to do things whatsoever the Holy Spirit wants you to do. You just have to stir up that gift and believe in the Holy Spirit and you'll do more than you think. Just stay with God, always. The Holy Spirit will do more for you than you will dream. Reading further, but one more thing. Verse 39 says what? For the promise is unto you and to your children. So the Holy Spirit is a what? A promise. promise. Jesus said, I go, but I will not leave you comfortless. I will pray the Father to send you the comforter. Jesus just made a promise that he's going to send you the comforter. When you are baptized, his promise is fulfilled you get the comforter. It's a promise from Jesus, a gift of God, given to you freely because you believe in the name of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. It's a free gift given to you, just believing on the name of Jesus Christ. 
Now I might know Peter on the day of Pentecost, after receiving the Holy Ghost with the other disciples, spoke to the people to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Stay with God, a promise to us from God. God's promise is doubtful or uncertain. Doubtful or uncertain? God, I said doubtful or uncertain. God's promise is sure. Don't listen to those two words. That's a question asking you. Is God's promise uncertain? Is God's promise in doubt? God's promise is sure. Definite. Yes, that's what I said. But everybody got. What's he talking about? I was asking you to confirm. As Jesus said in the Old Testament, my word will not go forward void. It will accomplish that which it is sent to do. This is in the Old Testament. And Jesus' word at that time in the Old Testament is the Holy Ghost, not Jesus Christ. This is actually Jesus who turned the talking, God the Son saying his word will not be sent forward and not accomplish that which it is sent to do. It will accomplish. If we stay with God, let's, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. These are small excerpts where Paul is speaking to confirm our words. First Timothy chapter 4. The three keys again, so if you come across a new one, if you come across Timothy, Thessalonians, Titus, Timothy is right there. The three keys are together. First Timothy chapter 4. And Paul is talking to Timothy, giving him advice of comfort. Be reading from verse 13, 14, and 15. Those three voices. First Timothy 4. We read together, if you have it, verse 13, 14, and 15. Paul says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy prophecy may appear to all. And verse 14 is letting you know, neglect not the gift that is in you, do not neglect the gift in you. Not word neglect is a powerful word there. Do not take it for granted. Do not sleep on it. Utilize it as much as possible, the gift within you. And we all know the gift within us is what? Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> neglect not. Let's try Second Timothy chapter 1. Next page, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. What does Paul have to say to Timothy? Wherefore, go ahead, congregation. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. That's the next page. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. My hands means Paul prayed for him. Paul most likely may have baptized him. Uh, Paul is letting you know how uh, Jesus has let you know, Paul has let you know the gift of God is the Holy Spirit which is abides within you. 
So there's no need at no time never ever to invoke something that's within you. You just need to stir up the gift. It's already in you. If you have been baptized in Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God is in you. You don't need to invoke it. You don't need to ask for it. You need to stir up the gift that is within you. And in Titus 1 and 2, we have another confirmation. Titus 1 and 2, that's right after Timothy. <coughs> in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. So Paul is letting you know, this promise that has been given to us by Jesus Christ, his promise is sure. A promise before the world began. In hope of eternal life, it's God that cannot lie. God cannot lie. Jesus said, you will have it, we have it. It's up to us to believe that we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Let us move forward and not doubt. Now we're going to deal with Paul in his means of Holy Ghost, which I stated, I stated to you earlier. Let's go to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Let's see what Paul has to say here. In Romans chapter 5, we're reading from verse 14 through 19. <laughs> <clears throat> Romans chapter 5 reading from verse 14 through 19 wherefore sorry nevertheless that reading from Adam to Moses even over them that have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the favor of him that was to come? Will not ask the offense. So also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift of grace, and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, had abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. I just read the 16th verse beyond that. So Paul is confirming us to let us know that the Holy Ghost in us is a free gift given. Not that we wait for it, or we earn it, or we deserve it. But because we are God's children, He loved us that much that He gave us His gift. And if we stay with God, these gifts, promises of God will be given. Let's say, have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? Paul spoke to us, body of people. But I'm asking you, all in here. Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? If you are, if the answer is yes, the gift of the promise of the Holy Ghost is sent to you. Compliments of God the Father. Let's read 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Not St. John, please. First John. That's near the book of, back of the book, near Revelations. Near the back of the book, near Revelations. First John chapter 4. What is it saying? Verse 4. 4 and 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you 
the need that is in the world. Now we understand who is key within you. The Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit is in you, who is in the world? <laughs> Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So who is in the world? Satan. Satan is not greater than the Holy Spirit. That's this phrase now accomplished. That you know greater is he within you than he in the world. So you know the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Comforter is greater than the devil in this world. That's what this particular voice is applying. It's telling us, let us know that John is speaking to us. If we stay with God, the Holy Ghost abides within us. Now the Holy Ghost anoints, appoints, approves, adheres. I'll repeat that. The Holy Ghost, we're moving into another realm with Paul's activities. The Holy Ghost anoints, appoints, approves, adheres, etc., 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 and so on. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. And let's see what happens here. Acts chapter 13, where Paul is talking. To dwell to waste two. This is a famous event that many people get wrong and confused. Let's hope that we'll all understand this event now. And let us not be confused with it. You said Acts 13? Acts chapter 13, verse 2. If you get to verse 2, let's read verse 1 so you'll understand. Let's get some understanding of verse 2 if you read verse 1. Together, everybody, verse 1. We all have that? We all have Acts chapter 13? Verse 2? Verse 2, but we can read 1 and 2 just so you'll understand 2. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas. And Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and my name, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetriarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for a great where who I have called them. Now, what is happening here? In this second voice, the Holy Ghost is speaking. And what does Holy Ghost say? We can separate Barnabas and Saul. It is the Holy Ghost is saying here, we're going to separate Saul from Barnabas. Now I believe most of you might be familiar with the story that Saul and Barnabas had a fight and they separated. You all familiar with that? Anybody familiar with that? They had an argument, a big argument, and, and they had a separation. But now you know, according to this voice, there was no argument. This is an act of God, an act of the Holy Ghost. That's right. so the Holy Ghost is setting up Paul and, and uh, Barnabas to separate. Now why is the Holy Ghost separating them? Why is the Holy Ghost separating Let's go to chapter 14, right there in Acts. They separate them for special week. Hello? The special weight which they were called. They yes. Were called. They were separate. They were separated for a special. They separated weight. for the work that God has called them to do. God has called them. Yeah. And because of the work that needed to be done, the Holy Ghost separated them so that these two, if they together, they would, the work would not be done quick enough. So if I separate them, we get more work done in different places. So verse four, chapter 14, verse 14, the Holy Ghost is at work yet again to continue this saga. And together, let us read verse 14 and chapter 14. Fourteen and 
Yes. 14 and 14. Acts chapter 14 and 14. Which men the apostles, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Paul, hurried off, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out. Now let's read verse 14 again and understand that. Take your time. Which, when the what? Stop right there, that word apostle. Is that a prune or single? In my Bible, is plural. It's plural. Yeah. So then the two names were called Barnabas and Paul. So the Holy Ghost has ordained Barnabas and Apostle. And this is where the separation comes from. The Holy Ghost has ordained Barnabas and Apostle. And he's going to help Barnabas take his nephew Mark and they're going on their journey to the Macedonia. And then Paul will go with Silas and on his journey. That's where the separation will take place. Now let's go back to 13 verse 9. We go back to Ms. Butler jumping the gun on my speech of my message here. Oh no, you ask the question so I answer it. <laughs> oh, we, we are here. We are here. That's why I said if you have a question or doubt, please right now. Right now, uh, Let's ask, let's answer it, each person's question. Chapter 13, verse 9. Then who? Yes, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. So this is, we know that at this point, Saul now, name now changes to Paul. Saul name now changes to Paul. And bearing in mind, there are computations I did that I can't show you here. But this is 18 to 20 years later. Saul preached with the name Saul. 18 to 20 years later, he changed his name to Paul. He was not Saul at the blinding light, which many people think. And after he was blinded, he went to uh, Arabia. Arabia. Spared there for a couple of months, a couple of years, and he came back seeing uh, with the name Paul. No, he came back preaching on Saul. Because even after he came back preaching, there are many scriptures that says, Now Saul went to see the apostles. And they didn't believe it. And they didn't believe it. Now Saul was preaching here, and Paul was preaching there, and the people were scared when they hear the name Saul coming to preach. They run. Instead of coming to say, Let's take us a bed. So the name Saul. He was preached for 18 to 20 years before he changed to Paul. Now he changed his name to Paul at the moment in time when, right here in this 13th chapter, when he and Barnum were separated. After they separated, he changed his name to Paul. And it was done right in Barnum's hometown, Salamis, in the island of Cyprus. That's Barnum's home country. Let's continue further. Any questions at this point? Let's go to Acts chapter 15. Verse 39. Together we read Acts 15 verse 39. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. Cyprus is Barnabas' hometown, an island. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren. It wasn't just those four, they were in a group of other people. They were recommended by brethren unto the grace of God. And he, Paul, went through Syria and Cilicia confirming the churches. <laughs> so now we know, and the contention is this word here, 39, and the contention. When people read that word, this is where they think Saul and Paul had this big to do. But it was the do that they had, but it was the Holy Ghost that set it up. 
for them to separate. And Paul, Paul went further to, to the east, and Barnabas went to the west. Now it doesn't say each verse here, it's just that I know the geographics of the area that I can say. As they went forward, this is the act of the Holy Ghost, anointing Barnabas and appointing them to their position out in BC for the furtherance of the work of the gospel. Now in my words I have here, Saul and Barnabas separate for the work of Jesus. This verse, the Holy Ghost, approves the separation of Barnabas and Saul, that's verse 2, who is Paul, soon to be known as for the work of the Lord. Before the separation of the Holy Spirit announced Barnabas an apostle. Now we all know that Barnabas was an apostle, so there's not just 13, we know there's 14 apostles that are documented in the book. The Holy Book. Barnabas, an apostle, now separates from Paul, relates to a contentious event solely for the Lord's work. Barnabas chooses his nephew, John Mark, who adheres to Barnabas for the work, and he passed for Cyprus, Barnabas' hometown. Barnabas took Paul took Silas, all recommended by the brethren, into the grace of God. Stay with God, marvelous things happen. Let's read Acts chapter 4 and 36 for confirmation. Acts 4 and 36, right in the book of Acts. Well, in 36 says, anybody have it? Acts 4 and 36. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus. This way just lets us know Barnabas is from the country of Cyprus where he left and went with his nephew, John Mark. John Mark is the individual to whom is attributed the book of Mark. In the beginning, any questions at this point with these guys? Any question at this point, these guys? When you finish. Hello? When you finish, I want to make a comment. I want to, and, but this is in the 13th, where he's like, I can't see you good now. I got to open my eyes. I want to just comment on something. We're going to skip. In the beginning, God said, let there be light as time takes on. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. The Spirit of God. The Holy Ghost is and was with God then, even to now. As it is written, on the day of Pentecost, we, mortal beings, being sons of God, received the Holy Ghost indwelling within us, as promised by God, the Son, Jesus, the Christ. Stay with God, as promised is sure. It's the Holy Spirit. From the beginning, let's read Genesis chapter 1. Your confirmation. First verse, 1 and 1. As we prepare to wrap up. John, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. It's all open now to get it, please. Somebody read. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form, verse 2, and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Here in the first voice, second, lets us know that the Spirit of God was with God from the beginning. From the very beginning. God's Spirit. Which still brings us to what? How do you define God's Spirit? 
For many of us know it. You got to take some Methodists, the Anglicans, they got this thing of saying, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, Amen. Now why do they say God the Holy Ghost? Because the Bible does not verify the Holy Ghost as being God. The Bible verifies quite clearly as we have covered. The Father is God, the Son is God, but the Holy Ghost is not identified from Genesis to Revelation as God. Then what is God? What is the Holy Ghost? How could you define what is the Holy Ghost? Let's understand what Jesus says here in 1 John. No, we don't want that one. We're going to jump, move fast forward. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Somebody read that, please. Matthew chapter 12, verse 31. Jesus is speaking about the Holy Ghost. Matthew 12 and 31. What is Jesus saying? Matthew 12 and 31. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto you. That shows you how serious God is with His Holy Ghost. As you know, the Holy Ghost is not God. How do you define it? Can we read this blue writing here? Can anybody read the blue writing from where you stand? Where you sit? This is my personal definition of the Holy Ghost for my study and understanding. What is God's Holy Ghost? Understanding what it is. It says, Anybody read it? God's whole, Holy Ghost is God's spiritual, spiritual machinery of with primordial powers. I'll explain every word if you can. God's spiritual machinery with primordial powers of omnipotence, omnipotence and infinity. Invincible above and beyond supernatural means. Now let's break it down. God's spiritual machinery. Spiritual, we all know, that's something you can't see. God is spirit. Machinery. Machinery is anything that you have that works for you, with you, about you, and does whatever you want. That's the human definition of machinery. Anything that works for you, does what you want, however you want it, whatever you do. So God's un unable to be seen, unknown, equipping that will do whatever God wants it to do with it, it will be done by God. With primordial. Primordial means before the beginning of time. Anything that is before the beginning of time. Primordial. Before the beginning of time. But Primordial powers, so before the beginning of time, this Holy Ghost has powers. What kind of powers? Omnipotence powers. What is omnipotence? Omnipotence is the ability to be anywhere, anytime, anyhow, any place. All at the same time. The Holy Spirit could be here with all of us and still be in China, be in Ukraine, be in the United be on Mars, Pluto. Omnipotence to be anywhere, anyhow, anytime, with anyone, always. Omnipotence. Omnipotence means the greatest ever was or will be. Nothing greater. Nothing whatsoever is greater. When you are of omnipotence as a noun, you are the greatest above all. Omnipotence and infinity. Infinity means no end. No end. Anything that is infinity does not have an end. It goes beyond. There's no capturing to the end of it. Infinity. Beyond wherever you can. Think of, imagine, beyond your imagination. Beyond your dreams. Beyond everything. 
infinity beyond far and infinity invincible invincible is another way for omnipotence two words that means nothing greater than me I am the greatest nothing omnipotence means greater than all whatever invincible above and beyond above and beyond supernatural now you all we all know supernatural is like superman stronger than what are nothing stronger than superman nothing stronger nothing greater than whatever means you may think of so if you put those boys together this is not something i just done uh, this is a study i did years ago i'm just bringing it here to this body and i did this to another church years ago so all I'm doing basically is bringing to you things that God has given me so that you may know. Now, if you all will accept those words, you can write them down, put it to your thoughts. That's why I put it in writing, because I know I have it here, but I put it to your writing. And trying to understand God's Holy Spirit. And wrapping up, I thank you all there's one last part you all may have heard about the finger of God. Let's read this one. Let's go to Luke 11 and 20. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. And we'll wrap up here. Luke chapter 11, verse 20. Luke chapter 11 verse 20 says what? This is Jesus Christ speaking now. But if I with the finger of God cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Now what Jesus cast out devils with? And the finger of God must be the Holy Ghost. What is the finger of God? It must be the finger of the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, but if I with the finger of God cast out devils. Jesus casting out devils with the finger of God. He's utilizing the Holy Ghost. So all that Jesus does, he waits with the Holy Ghost. And one more for your clarification. Let's take you into Deuteronomy chapter 9, Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8, verse 19. This is to show you the, the Holy Ghost at work, and then we close up. Exodus chapter 8, verse 19. This is a time when God has told Moses to go face Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. This is when that is happening. Uh, Exodus 8 and 19 says then the magician said unto Pharaoh this is the finger of God and Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he hardened not unto them as the Lord had said Pharaoh's magician is telling him this is the finger of God as all those plagues and things that Moses was putting on Pharaoh to let him know and Pharaoh's, God said he will hide in Pharaoh's heart. So you see, the Holy Ghost was at work from the beginning, even doing all the work for Moses. That was the finger of God. A word to relate to, and I hope and pray that somewhere along in our teaching that you would have learned something tonight and be inspired. As I move forward to close over the song that lets us know that the Holy Ghost will knock out a whole lot of stuff and get things right. It took the Holy Ghost to knock the devil out of me. Holy Ghost to knock Devil out of me When I gave my heart to Christ